This is a Faith Defenders audio presentation with author, lecturer, and Christian apologist, Dr. Bob Morey. Tonight I have a task that has been laid upon me to deal with the issue of baptism, water baptism, not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We're not going to deal with that tonight. We're going to deal with water baptism and not the subject of the mode, sprinkling, pouring, or is it three times forward, three times backward, or straight up and down, or one time? Not any of that. Or babies, or adults, we're not dealing with that. Your pastor has said to deal with the issue of whether or not in God's plan of salvation, baptism is part of the essentials to get into heaven. Very, very important. Because this not only touches upon the heretical teachings of the Church of Christ, but also the United Pentecostals, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Roman Catholics, the Greek Orthodox. There are many, many, many religious organizations which would tell you that their particular brand of baptism is essential for salvation and the bottom line is this, Jesus is not enough. He's not enough. Let's pray. Father, we come to you because we are jealous for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything that would eclipse that glory, that would degrade from the dignity of his person, the glory of his work, makes us upset. Anyone that would suggest that Jesus did not pay it all on Calvary's tree, that his atonement was not sufficient and efficient, and what he did by way of sacrifice and atonement, this work was not perfect, but there's something, something lacking that we have to add ourselves. Father, this gets us so upset. We see why the Apostle Paul was so concerned about the Galatian heresy. We see why he was so concerned about the Colossian heresy. Anything that robs Jesus of his glory upset him, and it upsets us too. Therefore, Father, we come not in an angry spirit, but because we love Jesus and what he has done for us and our love for him makes us jealous of his glory. And help us to be like the Apostle Paul who would not even for the space of one hour put up with those who would detract from the work of Christ by putting forth their own works. Make us to be bold as lions and courageous as the great men and women of God in ages past. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews? The book of Hebrews is the first book in the general epistles, sometimes called the Hebrew epistles. Because like Matthew and the book of Romans, it deals particularly with the Old Testament's relationship to the person and work of Christ. If you turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 5, we have a wonderful statement of the author concerning the dignity of the work of Christ. Verse 8, although he was a son, the Greek said, although he was and remained to be a son throughout his entire life, at no point did Jesus ever cease being the Son of God. This passage is important, as I point out in my book on the Trinity, because in Philippians 2, when it says, although he was in his essence God, it's the same Greek word meaning, although he was God in essence, and he always remained to be God, never ceased to be God for one minute while he was on earth. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. 
and he grew in his humanity. And having been made perfect, that is, in his humanity, the Messiah, the man called Jesus, was perfected in the sense of maturity. It's the Greek word that you would use to describe a tomato when it was just right. And now in California, an avocado, as I have now discovered the delights of a real ripened avocado, when it's ripe and ready, that's the Greek word. When he was ripened, when he was mature, coming to its own, he became to all those who what? Obey him, the source of what? Eternal salvation. In other words, the author says, now listen, do you want two weeks salvation? How many of you want to be saved for two weeks and that's it? Please raise your hand. Well, maybe I'll give you two years salvation. Come on down to the altar and receive Christ and for two years you're saved. No, what kind of salvation does Jesus give? Eternal salvation. Not two weeks, two days, two years, 20 years. Eternal salvation, but how do you get it? You must obey him. Now, see, Christians don't like to hear that. They say, I don't want to hear that. The whole thing is to get rid of obedience. You know the old hymn, has been twisted by some, freed from the law, oh happy condition, now I can sin and still have remission. Maybe I'll have to pass that by some of you again. And you see, obedience is something that is pointed out by the author of the book of Hebrews, and he says, those who obey Jesus Christ are the ones who will receive eternal salvation. What in the world does that mean? It means that you have to do what Christ commands. Obedience is always the response to a command. When you tell your child, throw out the garbage. If he is an obedient son, like mine, he gets the garbage and he takes it out. And his dad says, what a wonderful son. If he's a disobedient son, he says, take it out yourself. God help us from disobedient sons. Well, you see, what does this mean? Well, does this mean we have to keep every single commandment in the Bible? Oh, wow. Have you ever counted all the commandments and laws? Do this, don't do that, go here, go there. Whoa! How many think that the Jews counted the commandments in the Old Covenant? Some of you know how the Jews are accountants by nature. You know, Goldman, Goldsmith, and Silverberg. They've been doing that for centuries, counting letters. They knew how many letters in the Hebrew Old Testament. They knew how many words. They could tell you the middle letter of the middle word in the middle sentence of the middle book. They're over there adding them up. How many of you think they counted how many commandments there are there? Yeah, and then they multiplied it by 10. They took one commandment. You shall not boil the kid in the milk of its mother. And out of that made 310 laws. So, you know, you say, well, what does this mean? We, we have to obey Jesus. Those who obey Christ receive eternal salvation. If you go through the New Testament, they're just laws and rules and do this and do that. Is that what it means? Well, if that's what it means, then no one's going to be saved and we might all, well, leave here and hit the local bar. Hey, if we're going to hell anyway and we're going to be miserable there, we might as well live it up now. That's what I told my wife. I was studying to do the book on atheism. I'd been encouraged by Walter Martin and others to say, it's about time somebody did a number on the atheists. Look at their arguments from the standpoint of logic and philosophy. Someone has to read all of that trash. So, 
I went and got all the books and spent about two years, the Library of Congress. I read every atheist, skeptic, agnostic, you name it. I read books and tracts. I debated the top atheists in the country. And I was downstairs one time studying the case for atheism, and my wife says, honey, I'm worried. What, what, what if they refute you? What if you run across a book that destroys your faith in God? What would you do? I said, oh, we sleep in Sundays. We don't have to go to church anymore. She said, you mean if you really got refuted, you'd give it up? I said, I believe in truth. You follow truth wherever it leads you. And after I finished reading everything and talking to Paul Kurtz and all of these other people, I came upstairs, I was ready to do the book, and I said, honey, they have absolutely nothing. I have found the atheists and all of their arguments against the Bible and against God. They simply have nothing that would even give me the tiniest doubt. I have weighed them in the balance of logic and have found them to have nothing. Well, you see, if, if we had to obey all those laws, and remember how the Old Testament says, thou shalt obey with all of thy heart, all of thy time, and all of thy day. You see, it's perfection. 100% of you, 100% of the time, 100% of the laws. And if you just break one, James says you're guilty of how many? Oh, he said, man, I was almost to heaven. I kept 9,999 and five minutes before I died, I broke one. <laughs> That's it. Oops, there it goes. Oops, there it goes. Well, you see, the Bible says that salvation is by grace apart from the works or obedience to the law. It says this in Romans 3, 19 through 22. It says this in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. It states it again and again, by grace you were saved through faith. It is not through works. I mean, the, the New Testament couldn't be clearer. It is not by our obedience to the law. You see, the point comes to this. My acceptance before a holy God, is that acceptance going to be due to something I do in terms of keeping laws and being good and kind and wearing a funny hat or whatever it is, or is my acceptance before God on the basis of someone else's perfection and obedience and righteousness and truth? You see, the New Testament again and again, it says salvation comes as an item of grace, not merit. Merit means you own it. Let me give you an illustration from the book of Romans chapter 4, if you would please turn there. What shall we say in verse 1 about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Romans chapter 4 and verse 4. What are we going to say about Abraham? Pretty good dude, head of our race. You see, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. You see that? If his standing before God, finding acceptance before God, is on the basis of his person and his performance, then he has a reason to walk around and say, hey man, hey man, I'm somebody to look at. Even God pay attention, he must pay attention to me. His acceptance is based on my character, my performance, my person, and now Paul adds, but not before God. Not before God. For what does the scripture say? For Abraham believed God. 
And it, that, that is the faith, is very clear in the Greek, that faith was reckoned. Now, the Greek word reckoned is an accounting term. It means put on the books. It was credited to his account so that his faith was reckoned to him as if he had kept all the laws. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited, put on the books as a favor. How many of you work for your living? Okay. How many of you get your paycheck Friday? Let's say Friday. You got a Friday, you got a paycheck. How many of you, you come and it's Friday and the boss says, boy, am I going to do you a favor this week, Fred? Out of the goodness of my heart, I'm giving you $1,000. $500, $900, $200, no matter what it is. You say, what? Say what? Yeah, it's a favor, it's a gift. Of the company's decided to give you this check this Friday. You say, now hold on, honey. <laughs> you owe that to me. You are in debt to me. That is my due, that those are my wages. You owe me that money. So don't think for one moment it's a gift and you're doing me a favor. Well, you see, this is what we must understand about salvation. Salvation is not something God owes us. We don't have any wages because we can't do any good works. So God does not owe us, so you can't go to God and say, you better give me heaven. I earned it right now. Fork it over. <laughs> but you see, people all the time think God owes. They say, what about the heathen? I said, well, what about you? <laughs> well, doesn't God give them a chance? I said, who says they earned a chance? God doesn't owe them salvation. They know you so. They know anybody salvation. Or else salvation would not be a gift of grace. It would be a wage earned. So he says, look, to the one who works, his wage is not looked upon as something that's a favor, but it's something that is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies, now we come to one of the greatest theological battles in the history of the Christian church. How many of you knew that this verse has been a battle for 2,000 years? Please raise your hand. You understood the depth of it. There's a few. There's a few. Him who justifies, look at the text. Don't look at me. Who justifies the good people. Is that what it says? The godly people. The righteous people. It doesn't say that. God justifies the ungodly. You mean he credits righteousness to their account so they can come in his presence when there's only ungodliness in their person and in their performance? Yes. Well then, on what basis can God accept them when they don't have any godliness? Because there was one who had the godliness necessary, who for 33 and a half years lived without sin. And he who knew no sin became a sin sacrifice that we who knew no righteousness might have his righteousness put to our account. For you see, in the wonderful work of justification, we are talking about the last great television show of history entitled, This Was Your Life. Now, some of you old geezers here, how many of the elderly will now recognize that they knew the television show, This Was Your Life? I mean, come on, show your age. The Day of Judgment is just a variation. Uh, Joseph Smith 
This was your life. On the day of judgment, you're going to be called up, child. And the books will be open, you see. And the books will say, now this was your life. And open to the section under sin. God the judge, Christ sitting there as vice. He says, all right, did this guy sin? You say, oh, Lord have mercy. Look at this. <laughs> Lord have mercy. That trap door is going to open right now. I can smell the smoke coming up. <laughs> the judge says, well, what righteousness did this man do? Not a thing on the page. <laughs> Didn't do a sin. There's none that do with good. No, not one. None righteous. None understand. No one seeks after God. He said, oh, man, I'm had. And then your lawyer comes. His name is Jesus. He said, psst, give me your book quick. Okay, he takes his book, this was your life, Jesus Christ, and he takes the contents out and he switches it with your book so he gets your life in his book and you get his. So then God says, well, how many sins did you do? Open up his book. They said, we will. Wait a second. Here it is. <laughs> Hold up. We're going to find the page. Here it is. How many sins did you do? He said, my, my, you never sinned once in your entire life, did you? No, sir. <laughs> not a blemish on my record. Read it right here. Thirty-three and a half years, not one sin. Well, what about good deeds and righteousness? Well, look at this. Page after page. Page after page. He says, well, then that's, that's clear now. Come, ye blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. We are saved by the righteousness of Jesus Christ being put to our account, you see. Trouble is, all of a sudden the judge says, bring that guy Jesus in front of me. What about your life? Open up. Take him to a tree. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For the Lord was pleased to lay on him the iniquity of us all. Our sins came upon him. He had to pay for our sins. Somebody had to pay. So he groaned on the tree that we might not groan in hell. And only because he is God and infinite in his nature, he could take the punishment due our sins, the very hell that was our due, and smother it in his own bosom till he suffered to the last second of it. And then in that mighty resurrection morning, that getting up morning, and he ascended and sat down at the right hand of God the Father, the Almighty. Heaven rejoiced. Why? Our sins have been paid for by Christ on the tree. By his righteous life, by his death, he lived the life we never lived. He died the death we should have died. And we're saved on the basis of his perfection being put to our account and our sins being put to his. That's what the Bible means when it says Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. So that justification is not something that God owes you or me because we did something. God justifies the ungodly. And it is through your faith that is put on your account. That's why justification is sometimes called just as if I never sinned. Justification, just as if I never sinned. Well, you see, the Bible talks about the work of Christ as being the basis. He's all in all, the Alpha, the Omega. He's the author, the finisher. He's it. Well, you see, well, then how are we going to handle this? Because it says you've got to obey him. Well, we're going to look at this and understand what we mean by this. 
One possible solution is to take all those commands of Scripture and divide them up. And you divide them up in terms of things to obey before you are saved and things to obey after you are saved. That is, before you are converted, there are certain commands that are directed to people who are unrepentant people, who are unbelievers, snapping and snarling against God. Then there are commands that have in focus people who are repentant, people who are believers. And thus the salvation experience means that all the commands of God can be broken down into two columns. Now when you look at the ones that are given to unbelievers, to unrepentant unbelievers, that's where you find preaching concerning conversion and justification and you talk about repentance and faith. So in Acts 20, when the Apostle Paul summarized his ministry there in Ephesus, he said, what I preached to you was repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. If you want a summary of gospel preaching, you will find it in Acts 20 and verse 21. When you come up to someone and you say, repent, what are you assuming? They need to repent. They're unrepentant. If you tell them, believe in Jesus, and that's a command, you see, repentance is a command. To believe is a command. So when you repent, you are obeying. When you believe, you are obeying. We talk about the obedience of faith. Faith is an act of obedience to God. He commanded you to believe in his son. But you see, what you have in mind are unrepentant, unbelieving folks, and you rush up to them and tell them, repent, believe Jesus, accept Christ, or whatever it is. Now, once they accept Christ, once they repent, once they believe, then you talk about sanctification. No use talking to unregenerate people about how to be holy for Jesus. They're not even in Jesus to even discuss that. You can't talk about the Christian life to Muslims, Hindus, atheists. Baptism is not for unrepentant, unbelieving people or else you just go out on the street and say, hey, hey, come here. Yeah. Come over here for a moment. Yeah. Grab him. <laughs> All right, put him in the van. Take him on down by the river. We're going to baptize him tonight. You don't tell unbelievers to be baptized. You're not telling unrepentant people to be baptized. The people who are supposed to be baptized are the believers, those who have repented, those who have bowed to Jesus Christ. Same thing as church membership. Do you go out in the street and hand out cards, attending church, giving offerings, Loving your wife, doesn't the Bible talk to Christian husbands? Say, love your wife, submit to your husband, discipline the church, take the Lord's Supper. Do you run out in the street with a little old thing of grape juice and some old little cracker and say, here you go! What's this? Take it, it's good for us, the Lord's Supper. Jesus said you got to take the Lord's Supper. Believers, those in the family of God take the Lord's Supper. You don't rush out and give it to just anybody. So that's why when I do communion, I talk and say, look, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have dealt with sin in your life and you're under the blood, you're more than welcome to take communion in this church. But if you don't know the Lord or you're living in sin, don't you dare touch those elements because God's going to get you. Some people have even died because they took the Lord's Supper when they were unbelievers or they were living in sin and they were rebellious believers. You see, repentance and faith are often mentioned in the same verse, but a lot of times they're not mentioned because repentance and faith are simply two sides of the same coin. Repentance can be mentioned by itself. And there are verses like Acts 2, 38. Now it says repent, but it doesn't say believe. Or John 3, 16 says believe, right? But does it say repent? No. You say, now why does the Bible sometimes say repent and believe and sometimes repent, sometimes believe? What's going on? Well, you see, repentance means you are turning from sin. 
Faith means you are turning to God. That's the definition in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, how you turn from idols to God. Now, can you turn to God without turning away from sin? No, you can't. As you turn from sin to God, this is repentance that now becomes faith. That's why one is implied by the other, and you don't always have to mention both of them. While God's grace is the grounds of salvation, the action of repenting and believing is always said to be the means, the means by which you receive that salvation. And this is why in the Greek language there are different prepositions. I'm not going to bore you with the Greek 101. But Scripture says, like many Christians I've heard, I've even heard preachers do it, misquote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I've heard them say, by faith you are saved. How many of you heard the quote, by faith you are saved? That's right. It doesn't say that. It says by grace, through faith. And you see the Greek there is saying, on the basis of grace as the foundation, the grounds upon which salvation comes to you, the medium by which you receive it is faith. Faith is never the grounds of salvation. God has never saved anyone because of their faith. The basis of salvation has nothing to do with human faith. It has to do with the work of Jesus Christ. The basis is God's unmerited gift through his son, it's grace. The basis of grace, the means is faith, and that's why he uses a different Greek preposition, dia, not hooper. Through faith, faith as the means by which you reach out. Like John 1 says, as many as received him, lambano in the Greek, it means to say, for example, if I said one of you who really likes this fickle flying finger of faith, <laughs> and I love to say, do you get the point? <laughs> this bright and intelligent young man with his skull full of mush sitting on the front row, if I said, this is yours, I give it to you, you really liked it, you were coveting this thing all day today, so it's, it's yours. Now, if he said, and I said, do you believe that this is now yours. He said, yes. And I'm giving that to you as a pure gift. You didn't earn it. I don't owe it to you. I'm just going to give it to you. Is it his until he actually comes and takes it? That's the Greek word lambano. As many as reach out and take it. Many people believe in Jesus but don't reach out and take Jesus into their heart. That's why we have nominal Christians by the multiple millions. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Great. But did you ever reach out and take him and put him in your heart? Well, what's that? It's called salvation, conversion, the new birth, you see. So it's always the means, never the basis. It's grace. Baptism in the Bible is something that repentant believers do. Obviously, repentance and faith comes before baptism. Have you ever found any passage which says, be baptized and then repent and believe? Any of you ever find such a text? Maybe in Second Opinion 5.3? I never found it in my Bible. You see, it is something that a Christian does, a child of God does, as part of the Christian life. This is why in the book of Romans, which is God's plan of salvation, is baptism brought up in chapter 1. No, baptism is not referred to in chapter 1. Is it referred to in chapter 2? No. Is baptism brought up in chapter 3? No. Baptism brought up in chapter 4? No. Hey, those are the chapters dealing with justification, salvation, faith. Conversion. Well, is it in chapter 5? No. When is baptism brought up? 
chapter 6. Verse, starting in verse 1, he's talking about sanctification. Now that we're saved, should we continue in sin? He says, no. Let's talk about baptism. Baptism is never brought up when the plan of salvation is under discussion. It's when sanctification and the Christian life is brought up. Just as much as the Lord's Supper, giving tithes and offering, becoming a member of the church, being baptized, uh, disciplining your children, these are all things that Christians do. We're not talking about things that the heathen run around and do. One clear example of this is found in Acts chapter 10. Would you please turn to Acts chapter 10? This is the passage that all of those who believe in baptismal regeneration avoid like the plague. They don't want to look at it. They don't want you to bring it up. Those who have a modicum of IQ, when you bring it up, their eyes roll. Like, oh, he's bringing up that one. Why? But this is a bad passage for them. Because you see, those who believe that baptism is the means by which you receive the grace of God, so the Roman Catholic says justification comes through baptism. That's the Roman Catholic position. And so is the Church of Christ. So is the Mormons. So are the United Pentecostals. Trouble is, whenever justification is discussed in Scripture, isn't it strange that baptism is never brought into the issue? It's not there. But here's a passage which is a good idea. If you look in Acts chapter 10, it's very clear, verse 44, while Peter was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell down upon all those who were listening, and all the circumcised believers who would come with Peter were shocked. Why were they shocked? Because he, they saw the gift of the Holy Spirit was being poured out on these uncircumcised Gentile dogs. Hey, they're second-rate people at the most. How come they're getting the Holy Ghost just like us? For they were hearing them speaking with tongues, exalting God. Man, they were shouting, rocking, and rolling for Jesus. Hallelujah! Blessed be the Lord! Who knows what they were speaking? And they were shocked. And they said, hey, isn't this what we experienced back in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Ghost fell on us? Yeah. And the Holy Ghost doing the same thing with these people. Yeah, that's right. Peter said, look, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? Peter said, now look, some of you were hesitating. What are we going to do with all these Gentiles who want to get in on a good thing? Well, we got to make them jump through hoops, get them circumcised, Give them some other laws, make them into good Jews, and then the Holy Spirit just might come upon them. They might be saved. But these people are already saved. They're shouting, praising God, speaking in tongues, just like in Acts 2. They have their own Pentecost. He said, now, which of you in his right mind is going to object to these people being baptized, seeing they have already received the Holy Spirit just like we did? And he ordered them to be baptized by the authority of Jesus Christ. What's the order? Peter preached the word. Cornelius, who was an unbeliever, heard the word. He repented and believed along with others. He was now a child of God. He was baptized by the Holy Ghost and fire. Spoken tongues, shouted, got excited. And then lastly, what was he? You say, now this is the wrong order. If baptism is the mechanism that saves you, where should baptism be? First. First. Now after he's baptized, he gets the Holy Ghost. No. 
Baptism is the outward symbol of the inner reality. It always comes after salvation. It does not accomplish salvation. You don't baptize sons of the devil. You baptize the sons of God. Cornelius obviously was a believer, saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost-fied, shouting ground, certified, catechized, Simonized. Then he got baptized. You see, Cornelius was a repentant believer. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. I've had Church of Christ people say, well, I refuse to accept this passage. There has to be something wrong here. And I said, no, the passage is not where there's something wrong here. It's your theology which cannot take this passage. It is impossible for those who believe in baptismal regeneration to handle this passage. It simply doesn't work. For this reason, we're going to deal this evening with 12 reasons why Campbellite baptism is not essential to salvation. Now, we could talk about Roman Catholic baptism, United Pentecostal baptism, Greek Orthodox baptism. It doesn't matter, but right now we're dealing with the Campbellites. And as I showed from last night when I referred to it as a Campbellite movement or Campbellism, I'm simply following the encyclopedias, the dictionaries, the history books. It's what scholars do. We understand what it is, and that's reality. And I say to those who say, well, you have no right to refer to them as the Campbellites. I said, well, I'm very sorry. You can lump it or leave it. That's the world of scholarship, and if you don't want it, too bad but that's the way it is. So we're not talking about baptism in general, except that what I'm saying will apply to any and all cultic groups who say that baptism is necessary for salvation. It only really matters if it's Mormons or they're Campbellites too anyway. But when we're dealing with the Church of Christ people, they really think they got it made. Their, their form of baptism, the mode, the subjects, their understanding, their concept of baptism is essential for salvation according to them. I didn't invent it. That's their position. Now, the first problem I face is this. The founders of the Church of Christ who demanded that everybody had to be baptized according to the understanding that the baptism was a means of salvation, the basis, one of the gr grounds of salvation. It was something in addition to the work of Christ. It was the means by which you receive the grace of Christ, whatever language they wanted to use. They referred to it as baptismal regeneration. That while they preached this, they themselves neglected to ever get baptized that way. Is that sunk in yet? Telling everybody, unless you get baptized by immersion unto remission of sins, understanding you're washing away your sins by the waters of baptism, and the waters of baptism touch the blood of Christ, and unless you're baptized in this way, with this understanding, you'll never make it to heaven. And if someone would have only had the sense to say, Hey, Tommy and Alex, Thomas and Alexander Campbell, father and son team, the duo, were you guys ever baptized this way? Oh, I wish I could have been there and someone could have asked them because they say, well, 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 it's not necessary. <laughs> you see, here's the point. If, as they taught, and the Church of Christ people continue to teach to this day, that the only baptism that is valid for salvation is the Campbellite doctrine of baptism, then the very founders of that doctrine are now in hell and are crispy creatures rotating in the fire. Which means the church was founded by the children of the devil. You see, when they were Presbyterians in Scotland, and all, the only baptism they had was an infant baptism by way of sprinkling. They felt they were Christians and never said that they weren't Christians. They just started telling everybody else, well, your infant baptism 
does it mean anything? You're not saved. But they never applied it to themselves till they moved to this country after the Presbyterians threw them out. And the Baptists took them in until they got ready to throw them out. And then they got baptized by the Baptists. But the Baptists don't baptize with the Campbellite understanding that this is a baptism that saves you. So when were they ever baptized in the Campbellite way? They were never baptized in the Campbellite way. Then the very people who run around preaching, you have to be baptized in this way, in this mode, according to these subjects, with this understanding, or you're not saved, they themselves never got saved. And oh my, oh my, that is something they have to really seriously consider. Secondly, John the Baptist's baptism did not save anyone. See, if you're saying baptism saves, well, who baptized first? You had John's baptism, then you had Christian baptism. Turn over to Mark chapter 1. Let's talk about John's baptism. That was the first baptism. And certainly we have to write to say, well, did John's baptism save anybody? Mark 1, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that the same language used of Christian baptism? <laughs> well, yes it is. That's true. Well then, the baptism that John gave surely uh, cleansed them of their sins and washed them in the blood and they were saved. And hence they would never have to be baptized again. But you look in Acts 19, and when Paul ran across people and the only baptism they had was the baptism of John, what did he do with them? Rebaptized them with Christian baptism. You see, we are told by John the Baptist himself later on and in many other passages that I baptize you with water, but the one who comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, meaning when I baptize you in the water, you ain't going to get the Holy Spirit. But when the Messiah comes, his baptism will fill you with the Holy Spirit. This is why in verse 8, Mark 1, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. If language means anything, we have a contrast. John's baptism did not guarantee the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So he said, I baptize you and the best I can do is dunk you in the water. But when Jesus baptizes you, you will receive the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, Jesus himself never baptized anybody. Did you know that? Not one human being in the history of the world can talk about water baptism. If you look in John chapter 4 in verse 2, verse 1, this is a very important point because I've had Church of Christ people and Mormons. Well, what do you mean Jesus never baptized anybody? Doesn't the Bible say that Jesus was baptizing more disciples than John? You look in chapter 4 and verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, they said, there it is, Dr. Bob. Jesus was baptizing more people than John baptized. Hallelujah, we find the truth at last. You're a liar, Dr. Morey. I said, read on. Just keep moving. Just mosey on down to the next verse. Do you see a period at the end of verse 1? Anybody have a period in there? No. You have a semicolon? No. Question mark? Exclamation? Any? No. What does that mean? You got to mosey on down to the next verse. 
although Jesus himself, what does it say? Was not baptizing. His disciples did the baptize. Now think for a moment. If baptism is that means through which we are saved, and Jesus never baptized anybody, did he ever save anybody? Hmm? That doesn't logically compute here. Something's wrong with the idea baptism is essential for salvation. It wasn't in John's view. It evidently wasn't in Jesus' mind. Fourthly, Paul clearly states that baptism is not part of gospel preaching. To the Corinthians, he says, God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. What does the word but mean? I taught a class one time on butology. <laughs> now, butology is very important. That's where you examine the buts of the Bible. And you look at texts where that word but, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. I heard the famous Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. I love the English preachers. I was a member of a church for eight years under Stephen Olford, one of the great English expositors, and heard him speak on the buts of the Bible because it's way of contrast. It means not this, but this. He says, Christ did not send me to baptize people, but to preach the, preach the gospel. So in Paul's mind, preaching the gospel did not include baptism. Right? Any of you English teachers here? High school, I taught English in high school. You, no, you, I murder the Queen's English, but that's okay. He said it didn't. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, if you turn there, when he's summarizing the gospel, he says, I make known to you the gospel. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. And you must be baptized forward once in the name of the Holy Trinity. Is that what it says? When he is defining the gospel in chapter 15, is baptism in the equation, folks? Christ died for our sins, Christ was buried, and Christ arose. That's the gospel. So where does this business of baptism being part of the gospel? It isn't because, you see, baptism is for believers. The gospel is for unbelievers. You don't baptize unbelievers. You baptize believers. Remember one time with the Church of Christ woman, and I went over this over and over till finally went, bong, and she went, oh, I see it. Believers get baptized. Yes. Well, then it's not necessary to become a believer. No. Paul argues that justification has always been by faith apart from the works of the law. He does this in the book of Romans and he deliberately quotes from different sections of what we call the Old Testament. It's called the Tanakh in Hebrew. He says before the law, Abraham was justified apart from any acts of obedience to the law, particularly circumcision. He was saved before he got circumcised and that's why you Gentiles can get in on a good thing because he was a Gentile when he got saved. So then he quotes about David after the law. If you go back to Romans, remember we Romans 4, and he proved that Abraham was not owed salvation. He was saved on the basis of the faith that he had, and he was ungodly. And he quotes then in chapter 6, David's experience. He speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness. And what does it say? Apart from works. Apart from works. This becomes so important. 
that Paul says the fact that he was saved through faith before he was circumcised is why Gentiles can become followers of Jesus Christ. And you see the order? Faith, then circumcision. What, as we will see, takes the place of circumcision? Baptism, as we shall see. Baptism is the New Testament parallel to circumcision. You just read the book of Colossians, chapter 2. He talks about circumcision, and then he parallels it to baptism. It's there, just like the Lord's Supper. I mean, they were having a Seder. It was Passover. They got the upper room. They had the lamb, some bitter herbs. They had the unleavened bread. They were up there celebrating the Passover, and Jesus changed the Jewish Passover to celebrate when the angel of death passed over the firstborn back there in the plagues of Egypt to remember God took them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. He changed it ipso facto, ex opere operatus, into the Lord's Supper. What we do in communion is the Jewish Passover but with a twist saying because of Jesus the greater lamb whose blood was shed. The angel of death is going to pass over us too. Well, what happened to circumcision? Its parallel is baptism in the New Testament. You have Passover, Lord's Supper, circumcision, baptism. And this is the parallel. Now, throughout the Old Testament, did the mere act of physical circumcision save anybody? No, not if you read the Old Testament. Read Deuteronomy. It says, oh, that their hearts were circumcised. Circumcised Jews were out worshiping idols. Physical circumcision did not circumcise the heart. It was supposed to symbolize that. It was the outward sign of faith in the covenant God of Israel. Didn't work with most of them. Matter of fact, under the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, circumcision is what? Nothing. Nothing. That's why you're still in Romans. Turn to chapter 2, verse 28. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision, that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and the circumcision that means anything is a circumcision of what? the heart. Now is the circumcision of the heart something done by the scissors or by the Spirit? And it's not by the letter of the law, but it's an act of God's grace. Well, you see, the meaning of circumcision, it was symbolic of the work of grace in which the sin nature was cut away from the heart. And he's saying the real circumcision is the one that takes place in the heart as a work of the Holy Spirit. That's why if you look in Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, beware of the dogs. And no, he's not talking about wild dogs running on the street. He's not talking about pets, bichon frises, and poodles. He's using as a derogatory term to the Judaizers whom he viewed as savage dogs tearing at the church. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are what? The true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Now you have to ask yourself, if circumcision is the Old Testament parallel to New Testament baptism and circumcision did not save. It was an outward symbol supposedly of an inward reality. Though many people were circumcised and never made it to heaven's shore and circumcision was no guarantee. It was only the cutting of the flesh, not the cutting of the heart. Then how in the world can you claim that baptism does more than circumcision? It simply doesn't compute. Paul points out that Abraham was justified by faith before he obeyed God in circumcision. 
Let's back to Romans chapter 4, 9 through 11, particularly verse 16. We'll read them quickly since I've already emphasized this point by way of introduction. Verses 9 through 11, is this blessing then upon the circumcised or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness, that is, it was credited to his account as if he did it when somebody else did it, namely the Messiah. How then was it reckoned? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Verse 16, for this reason, circumcision is by faith that it might be in accordance with grace in order that the promise may be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Gentiles can say Abraham is our father just as much as a Jew because when Abraham believed, he was not a Jew. He was not a Hebrew. He was uncircumcised, a Gentile, till God in his mercy brought him out of idolatry. So Abraham was justified by faith before he was circumcised, just like we are justified by faith before we are baptized. Cornelius believed the gospel was saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, and then got baptized. Cornelius does not fit the pattern of baptismal regeneration. Many Pentecostal churches, I get involved, I preach everywhere, you'd be surprised where old Maury goes. And they'll say, what about tongues? And I say, on rye with Golden's mustard, it's wonderful. Next question. <laughs> Use humor to avoid offense. So we won't get into that. The thief on the cross went to heaven, he wasn't baptized. Now, this has proven to be such an embarrassment to the Church of Christ folks that they have written tracts and booklets in which they convolute the order of the death of the crucified. Even in the debate, you can order the debate. We sold out of it this morning. You can get it. Well, the catalog, we're out of but I'll bring more catalogs Wednesday, Saturdays. You know, I'm here for almost a month. The Church of Christ representative said, well, you see, the thief died on the Old Testament side of the cross because he died before Jesus died. So after Jesus died would be when the new covenant was in effect. But since the thieves died first and then Jesus, they were saved the Old Testament way. So I said, in other words, it was easier to be saved in the Old Testament than in the New Testament? then I want to be saved the Old Testament way, by faith alone. I don't need baptism or anything else. He made it to heaven. Why do I want to be under the new covenant when you got to get baptized and do all this other stuff? And besides, Christ had already died. The soldiers came, found the two thieves alive, and had to break their legs so that they would suffocate. If you must understand, with crucifixion, it wasn't the blood loss. It was simply that in order to breathe, you had to push yourself up with a nail in your foot, in, through your both feet. It was so incredibly painful that then you would pull on your hands and the nails were through your wrists, so every time you needed to take a breath, you would <coughs> And the pain became so horrible, you would rather stay slumped incapable of breathing and you would die of lack of breath. So in order to get these thieves, these thieves are still alive, will break their legs and they can't push themselves up to get a breath and they'll die. And when they came to Jesus, what did they find? He was already dead. Better make sure. And they took that spear and what did they do? Stuck it right up in there and out flowed the water and the blood of a ruptured heart. He had already said, tell Talestai, paid in full is the meaning of the Greek word according to the papyri. And after he said paid in full, it says with a shout, he dismissed his spirit. So Jesus did not leave this planet with a whimper, but with the shout of victory. 
because he had paid it all on the cross. Well, you see, the thief on the cross is so important because Christ died first, so was the blood already shed before the thieves died. Then the thief died on the New Testament side, not the Old Testament side. That's why Church of Christ preachers and will actually convolute the order deliberately to try to escape. The Campbellite doctrine makes salvation dependent upon the availability of water and of a Campbellite. So if you got an Eskimo rubbing noses with other Eskimos, eating whale blubber up there, and a Campbellite comes along and says, now you've got to be baptized by immersion in order to be saved. It's not enough. You in there in the igloo reading the Bible. Yes, I love Jesus. Not enough. We've got to find enough water around here to get you immersed. Water around here to be immersed. I don't even take a bath for six months. Yeah, I know. I smell when I come in this igloo, but that's okay. <laughs> hey, we'll hop on down to the Arctic Sea over there and let you plunge in, crack the ice, and jump in for Jesus. You want me to jump in that ice? I won't be coming up. You'd be dead, child, after you get in that water. Well, then you can't be saved till the, till the spring thaw. Salvation depended upon water. What about people in the desert? What about people? They laugh at one article. They've written, the Church of Christ uh, quite aware of me. <laughs> They're quite aware of me. One article, they said, Maury reaches new heights by talking about space travel. And what are they going to do when they're on their way to Mars and someone gets saved and accepts Jesus and there isn't enough water, and there's no immersion tank on board, or the space station, or they're on Mars or on the moon. Hey, I'm a Trekkie. <laughs> I understand. I'm from that generation. I believe unless the Lord returns, how many of you believe we're going to make it to Mars? Raise your hand. Come on. What? You didn't raise your hand. If the Lord does not return, how many of you, really? You don't? Anybody here honestly believe that space travel will not happen? Get a grip. It's already happened. We've already made it to the moon. Well, what you going to do? And you've got to have a Campbellite running around. It's not, remember, not anybody's baptism will do. Can't be Presbyterian baptism. Can't be Methodist baptism. Can't be Pentecostal baptism. Has to be a Campbellite baptism. Salvation is dependent upon water. What you going to do? Craziest thing I ever heard of. The whole point of the New Testament, anyone regardless of age, race, financial condition, rank in society, or location or culture can become a believer. Every tribe and every tongue, you believe in Jesus and it doesn't matter if you're red, yellow, black, or brown, or blue. It doesn't matter what culture you live in. The moment you trust in Jesus for your salvation, zip, zang, bang, you are in the body of Christ. The moment you say water is necessary, it has to be by immersion, and it has to be according to the way we understand it, you have said something that obfuscates and eviscerates the availability of salvation. The Campbellite doctrine confuses the symbol with what it represents and is based on a superstitious and magical view of baptism. I always ask them at this point, do you believe that the bread and the grape juice you take during communion are actually the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ? Do you commit cannibalism in the Campbellite churches? Is there such a thing as Campbellite cannibalism? No, we believe that those things are symbols. You do? Yes. Then on what grounds do you claim that baptism literally saves you? It is a symbol. It is a metaphor. I like to describe it as a gospel drama with actors upon a stage. When I take those people and I said, now, young man here, I've baptized. When I baptize people, I said, now, baptism looks back 
to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, so it is a gospel drama. It is the theater of the sacred. When I plunge them under the water, and they come out of the water, it symbolizes Christ died, he was buried, and it rose again, never to die again. That's why you don't get baptized over and over and over. How many times did he get resurrected? Once. I think this church down in Tennessee baptizes over and over for commitment. Now, Phoebe Wong had seven baptisms. I'm up to seven baptisms now. <laughs> you don't get baptized all the time. Christ got one resurrection, you get one baptism. That's it, baby. One per customer. It's seven times for so far. That was seven times. And it also is contemporary in that it says that you died with Christ, you were buried with Christ, and you rose with Christ. So it looks to the past, it looks to the present, then it looks to the future, for it says, then we should walk in newness of life even as he walks. And because he lives, we shall live also. You see, the Campbellites twist the scriptures to their own destruction. They try to mix works with grace, which is impossible, according to Romans 11:6, And that's another verse you should memorize. For it's of grace, it can't be of works. Or if it's works, it can't be of grace. Because you can't mix the two. It's like oil and water. Campbellites, Mormons, Catholics, all of them put grace and works in the glass, put on the cap, shake it up, shake it up. You see, it's grace and work. He said, now wait five minutes. What happens in five minutes? Grace and works, oil and water, you can't mix them. They will always separate. It's grace or works, not both. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, apart from the works of the law, such as baptism, church membership. To make salvation dependent on the presence of baptism in the absence of a piano. This is particularly, you see, I, you've got to understand, when you're debating, you've sometimes got to take the knife and sort of put it in and twist it a little bit. Because it's not just baptism. You've got a piano. You've got a musical instrument you're going to have. So you're talking about, well, if you have the presence of baptism, but you got a piano, you ain't going yet. <laughs> but to make salvation dependent on the presence of baptism in the absence of a piano is ridiculous as well as unnecessary. This has been a Faith Defenders audio presentation. For more of Dr. Morey's videotapes, audio presentations, books, and tracts, contact Faith Defenders, P.O. Box 7447, Orange, California, 92863. Order by telephone by having Visa or MasterCard ready and dialing 1-800-41-TRUTH or visit www.faithdefenders.com.